Welcome to the Oso oh Spurs podcast, where today we've got a slightly different panel with us today. We've got HG from the Cheese Room. How are you, mate? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah, it is a bit weird, just the two of us. But I think <laughs> it's, it's more intimate. It should be good, I think. It is. I'd say it's going to be more of a discussion <laughs> than previous pods. So, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. We're a bit late to the party on releasing the episode, but um, I think it's a good thing because it's let the emotions subside let people really think about what's been going on. We've got the international break ahead of us. So we've had some time to digest it and, and chat about it, haven't we? So, um, but should we, should we start with the Fulham game? Because I think now the dust settled, it'd be good to get um, your view as well. Actually, like, was that, I've, I've listened to a lot of pods and whatever media out of stuff saying that was kind of the worst performance of the season. It was diabolical. I couldn't give any player a good score, but I kind of, I didn't quite see it like that. I kind of saw it as this game where, Fulham had th- two very good chances and took both and a half chance and took it. Spurs kind of had one or two early good chances but didn't take theirs and Fulham seized the opportunity from there and then from then on we were just chasing a game of football that was too far out of our reach. But did you? how did you see it all anyway? I mean, kind of similar to you, it, it feels as if like, it was the worst result of the season and so, therefore, people, oh, well, the performance was terrible too. And I mean, it, like, it wasn't great. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that we played well and we were unlucky to lose 3 0. But I think that the Wolves' performance at the start of the season, the one at, at Wolves, was probably the worst one I can remember because we just didn't look very good in any of that game. And then we had our moments against Fulham. Again, maybe some of them happened when we were 3 0 down. But it does, yeah, I think, think you're right in that, you know, Fulham had a load of chances early and they didn't take any. But that's happened to Spurs before in this season, where yeah. kind of the first chance that's taken, it really, really affects the rest of the game. And when Fulham got theirs, it, it felt, OK, well, we've, we've been here before. But I don't think the key moment really for me was the second goal. And that, in my eyes, was a bit of a fluke. Once the second went in, I think the whole stadium changed. I thought, you know, a route is on. And Spurs just, just didn't deal with that. But yeah, I, I don't feel as if, Performance-wise, it was as bad as maybe some are saying, but it wasn't good either. Yeah, I agree. It, it didn't. Another point of the game was when I think it was three 0 wasn't it? When Werner kind of somehow missed. A, I'm yeah. sure the XG buffs would say that was a 0.99 out of one opportunity to score, and he somehow missed it. But I think if, if that had gone in, we've seen this Tottenham side suddenly get the tails up and you'd think, great, we're on for a point here. What a turnaround and we'd all be feeling very different. But I think it's just one of those days where you just, just things just don't fall your way and a ball hits the opposition's player's hip and goes into the bottom corner. Um, and it, you know, it falls to Timo Werner on his foot and he can't find an empty net. It's just one of those days. It's just not going to go, not, it's not going to be your day. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about the Brighton game, right? I mean, we were 4-0 down at Brighton. And that would have been the world's worst performance. Only mm. we got two late goals and there was a bit of hope that maybe we would come back even more. And I think I don't feel that, I mean, I, again, it's a, it's a while ago now. I don't remember too much about the Brighton performance, but I don't think we were very good that night. I don't think we were very good. We've had a few you know, games that we haven't been very good and haven't been punished. And the Fulham one, they, they did finally take some of the chances they created. Mm. I think that Fulham deserved to win. There's no doubt about that. But uh, for Spurs to, to, sit, to think that it was the worst one of the season, I, I don't think it was the worst performance. It's just we, we, we were on the wrong end of a team that had a bit of luck and took their chances. Yeah, it's, I think I've, I've seen a lot of negativity pointed a bit unfairly in my view as well. At, obviously, Ange is going to get flack. You, people are going to point the, the finger at, their finger at the manager. I, I didn't kind of see him getting things particularly wrong. I, I, I kind of put a lot of this on you look at the squad that he's got so far and there are still big gaps in terms of the type of people you need in certain roles versus what we have in certain roles. And I think we've discussed this before, like you look at even Werner, like you could see the value in him being a squad player and why he made sense as a loan signing right now. But if we're a side that's going to be challenging Man City and Arsenal for a title, you can't really go into a season with someone like that as your starting left winger. Um, and equally in midfield, Bissouma's not really been that great, aside from a brief flurry this season. But do, do you think he's another one in the squad um, that maybe we should be thinking about what Angel will be thinking about changing in the summer so that he can 
you know, really put his fingerprint on the team that's going to win these kind of games? I think Basuma is a weird one because although he hasn't got one year left on his contract, his contract runs out relatively soon. I think it's only two years. Um, but he tends to start games when fit. So in my eyes, at mm. least, Ange sees him as being a player that can be what he wants. Whether he ends up doing it consistently is a different okay. thing. But I think Ange knows it's possible. And I think probably from Spurs fans, we've seen that from Bissouma, certainly early on in the season when he was was dominating games a lot more than he is now. But yeah, like I think it was key that Ange was asked, you know, what positions are you looking for? And he turned, basically turned around and said, well, everywhere. Like he's not yeah. happy. Like so, th- th- there is a good chance that some of those first teamers that tend to play every week um, may not be playing every week when other people come in. But I don't feel as if Ange is thinking right. Like I've got a definite starter for this and a definite starter for that. Maybe Van de Ven and Romero would be the two. Okay, they would be definite starters. But still, outside of that, when it comes to outfield players, maybe he's thinking I, 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 maybe I can improve on Udogi. Maybe I can improve on. Pedro Porro. I'm not looking for a backup for either of those two. I'm looking for someone who could possibly be better than those two, um, which is not a bad way of looking at things. But it, it, it is indicative of, I think, Ange's desire that, that, whereas Spurs fans might think we're only one or two players away, three players away from doing something, he's thinking in, in bigger terms. Agree. And I've heard this from people who obviously followed Celtic and his other clubs, that he is just completely ruthless and not to get sentimentally attached to anyone in the team. And there's definitely players in our squad that I think people have a an affection for and would be, you know, perhaps a little bit of state of denial if you thought that Ange might want to sell them. But I, I'd look at some players like, dare I say, even Kulosevsky might be a player that Ange goes, for now, he is one of my better players. And I'm not, he's not a problem in this current team. But if I'm serious about winning a league next season, I need a right winger with a different set of attributes than perhaps he's got. And he must be looking at players like Sun, we discussed before, who is a world class finisher, incredible servant to Spurs, and I'd love him to sign a contract extension. But if we are to sign another striker, he becomes left wing. Is he? He's 32 years old. <laughs> Ange is going to be succession planning for all these kind of players, is, is what I'm saying. It's going to be really interesting to see what he wants to do this summer, but more so the preceding summer. I think it's going to be um, incredible to watch because like, he's only actually got in the squad, when we think about it. Van der Ven's and Johnson are his only real like, you know, permanent signings that we think are long-term options in the squad. Everyone else he inherited, who Doggy was pre-signed, already before he joined. Kulisewski, he was given the option to complete that transfer. But I don't think after two two weeks in the job, you're going to turn down Kulisewski at the price we were going to able to get him for. And then Porro was already signed. He hasn't really had any time at all to put his players that he really wants into the squad. And at the same time, people are quite critical of teams he's picked and things. I'm like, well, you can only pick what you've the ingredients you've got on the fridge. <laughs> he can't just, he's only been given limited funds like so far. He's been well backed, if that's the cheesy term he uses these days. But I think we need to give the guy a couple more transfer windows, don't we, before we can expect these results to dissipate into the past. It's true. And I think the good thing is that we all recognise that we needed centre-backs. He's recognised that we need centre-backs. I think he's come out and said that he wants another one. Mm. Right? He's, not, he's not happy with three plus Davies or three plus Phillips. He actually wants to sign another centre back. Now, who that is, whether they're homegrown or not, we don't know. But he, he's not resting on whatever laurels he has. It, it's all about, you know, I want to make this team better. I want it to grow. Now, you, you and I can sit here and say, hey, look, I think that Kulusevski might work better as a ten as opposed mm-hmm. to a right winger. I think it's also pretty clear that Kulusevski doesn't get substituted ever, right? Mm-hmm. Like maybe it's his versatility that, that ensures that, but still. He is the one that Ange may trust to always be there. I could sit here and say that, hey, Ange is trying to protect the players that he thinks will go and do something long-term. Maybe he takes Johnson off because he does, really does think that Johnson will turn out to be something special. Uh, and it doesn't need to play those games when we're losing by two or three. But it is... It, I guess it's kind of nice to not know. Like, yeah. you know I, I, I would have sat here and said that Benton... Benton Kerr is my favourite Spurs player right now. But he doesn't play. And I understand why, right? I mean, I do understand why. Like, yeah. He hasn't been great since he came back from injury. But it is, like, I want to see him be part of this team. 
Um, I love Udogi. I think Udogi's been one of our better players all season. And certainly in the last few games, just his attacking ability is I mean, it, it's evident. It doesn't matter whether we're defending or not. He's He's got one idea, and that's to go forward. But you just don't know whether it will whether it will last. I don't think Ange ever really thinks in absolutes of this is my guy. He might be my guy right now, but if someone does some things in training or form changes or whatever, he will <clears throat> he, he will he will make the adjustments. And if you go back to, I mean, maybe it's easier at Celtic where you can kind of cherry pick the better players in the league and foreigners that you want. But I don't feel as if he played the same team every week there either. I think no. An- Ange is going to be one of those managers who, I hate to say it, like Guardiola and like Klopp, where you might sit down and say, I think that's your best 11, but you may never really see that best 11 play very often because he's managing you know, squad workloads and who played last game. And it's, it, you know, I, I, do, I do think that the best managers think like that, where they have, I, I want 20 players that I trust and I, I will then play them based on who is the fittest or who is in the best state of mind to play that game. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And that kind of goes and matches up with his personality when you look at what his decisions he's made in the past. Whenever he's moved club, he's never brought specific backroom staff with him to follow him along, even though he's a popular character. He's never gone and cherry-picked out his favourite players from the previous clubs he managed. He's quite happy to start fresh with a fresh canvas and doesn't let let's say that emotional kind of attachment to things or people cloud his decision making he is simply looking at things of what is the best way i can get through this season with the best output and i don't care if your name is brennan johnson and i spent 40 million pounds on you and sanctioned that that transfer myself or if your name is oliver skip and you came from the academy i will pick whoever I think is right for this team. And I will sell whoever I think is going to slow down my progress in, in getting there. And it also, that matches up with the personality trait. We, we hear of him just keeping that distance from players so and staff as well, so that he can make those decisions more easily without that emotional involvement with selling people or, or, so or moving what, on. What you're telling me is that he's going to sell Benton Kerr and I'm going to be crying in the summer. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> I, I don't think he's going to sell Benton. Although Benton Kerr is one, like you, he's one of my favourites. And he's quietly, it's one of these things that, you know, people, they know it's happening, all our Spurs fans, but we don't want to talk about it. Like, it's kind of that, it's fine. He's, his knee, just his leg just needs an extra few months and he'll be back to his best. But I kind of get the impression he might not, be Ange's long-term first choice in midfield, which just seems crazy to say. Yeah. Because right now on paper, he is the best ball-playing midfielder we have by far. I yeah. don't know if you sense that. Am I being paranoid? I mean, I, 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 it's, it's because everything that Ange does seems to go against what we think we've learned from other people, right? Where mm. you do, We had Pochettino, we had Mourinho. We, all of them had kind of their favourites the ones that they wanted to play as much as possible. Um, in Mourinho's case, he then fell out with them and then never played them again. But still, the idea was initially, like, these are, these are my guys, these are the ones I trust. And with Ange, again, like, I can sit here and you know, have a look at who's played the most minutes and who's played the most games and assume that that means that Ange trusts them the most. But we just don't know really what's going on. Um, he seems a very honest guy and very you know, straight about how he feels. Um, but, you know, these players are signing long-term deals at Spurs, I guess assuming that there'll be long-term players at Spurs. And mm. you know, even though Kulisevsky was with us for 18 months before Ange came in, in, in that idea, he signed a, what, four- or five-year deal um, when, when he signed permanently. The same with Johnson. Like, we have to think that those players that have come in will get at least another season before um, something something changes. But for the ones like, again, there's so many players that really haven't had either consistent fitness, let alone consistent games, but mm. just been around to be on the training pitch for that long, that it's not as easy to, to make those judgments. I mean, we haven't even talked about Madison, who mm. I guess we think, you know, we've all heard about the, the famous phone call that Anne's had with Madison before he signed, kind of saying that, you know, that like, wh- wh- whether you come to us or not, you're going to see a, a different Tottenham. Um, Madison, to me, after his injury, has been about as effective as Benton Kerr's been. Like he's not been the player that we've seen before. I, I don't think that it's a long-term thing. I always believe that players can come back from injuries, 
but we have seen that it's it's, it's difficult to do so. And to come back, I mean, for, for Spurs to have won the amount of games we have is probably a testament to Andy's ability because the players, a lot of them, haven't been consistently good. And I guess to be, and as well, another thing to back Andrew a bit with all this is when we really think about the season, he's only actually probably had about a quarter of the season at the start where he had 70-80% of his squad available to him to kind of start to build things. And then the whole middle third of the season gets completely decimated through Chelsea and injuries, just destroys everything for a while. And then he comes back now and there's a fully fit squad and there's not fully fit, but almost fully fit and expectations shoot through the roof. But it's almost like he's had to begin that reassessment period all over again. <laughs> and then the, the squad looks mis- misleadingly strong because you're like, yeah, Madison and Benton are in there. But then if you should have an asterisk next to it, which says not fully fit, and if people play football manager, they'd have probably the orange 65% condition thing should only play 60 minutes with pain killing injections or something. So it's not as rosy in terms of the squad's health as maybe it looks. And I think that's really put some ex- like over, over intense pressure on how we're expected to perform in some games when really we're still, there's still really, members of the, go on. The thing is, though I agree with you right on that, I also sit here and think, you know, what, what players are out right now? Like Van der Ven should be back for the next game. So mm-hmm. you're looking at, and Richarlison was back on the bench for the last game. So when it comes to footballers, you're looking at Sessignon is out, Solomon is out. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, I mean, Sessignon, Does he he's count? barely a footballer, as, as, as awful yeah. to say. Um, Solomon's been out for five months. Like, when it comes to players that have played minutes for Ange, we've basically got everyone available now. And so then I do think that there, there should be a pressure to say, right, now, now we can see what you can do. Now, if those players like Madison aren't performing and you have Lacelso sitting on the bench who, again, may not be as good, or Kulisewski who could come into the... But are, are you going to try and win these games? Or are you <coughs> saying, you know what, Brian, as much as I think you've, we've been all right when you've played left wing, you are not part of my future plans and you are not going to play unless I have no choice. Because that's mm-hmm. what he might do with Lacelso. He hasn't done that with Hoiberg because Hoiberg has been needed. But still, there's this idea of if everyone's fit, we should be able to look at what happens in the next seven or eight games or to the end of the season and think this is really what Ange sees as being the players he wants to work with, he wants to keep around. Yeah, I guess that there is some certainty in <laughs> the future of the squad. For certain, Brian Hill is not part of the plans <laughs> beyond this season. He's not making the bench. Often, Sessignon's probably never going to fully recover. Um, Skippy, I kind of feel, is, is a player, another one people are going to, I know some people listening are going to go nuts. When I, whenever I dare bring up that Skip might not have a long-term future under Ange, Suns 32 is probably only going to have one more season as a starter at Spurs next season. Mm-hmm. And that Kuliseski is more of a really useful, versatile squad player in the future of this top. People really hate hearing that and, and I'll get shouted down by other people who have, who have a different opinion. But I do think we're getting a flavour for some of those kind of signals are coming into place. Skip's going further down the pecking order. Hill is banished. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, I, I agree, it's it's not overly clear where it's all, Yeah, it's all like going. none of us really know, but we can look at contracts... And we can see the players that are almost out of contract. If Ange wanted to keep them, those contracts would have been extended. They haven't been. Maybe the players aren't interested, but still, it hasn't happened. And if you're a manager, I understand that Ange needs results or wants results to, to build the team. But as he's talked about, whether we finish fourth or fifth or sixth to him, I, I don't feel like it's, he doesn't seem to really see the difference. To him, it's about mm. the, the growth of the side. So, like, he doesn't want to finish sixth. What he wants to do is finish first, right? He still wants that. But the idea of, I am not going to chase a result playing players who I don't think will benefit my team long term. Now, that, again, seems a bit weird to say for a football manager. But if you are content and you think that you know, your, your job's not under fire, then you will do that. The, the good ones should do that. They will say, I, regardless of, you know, of whether I get three points this weekend, 
I want to build something stronger than that, something that lasts longer than this weekend. And that's and so, exactly, yeah. God, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I kind of think that's exactly, and if we were in his seat, if we were playing a game of football manager, we'd do exactly the same decision. We'd be blooding the players we think of the long term future, shifting the old ones aside and trying to get rid of them. But it's as a fan, when you're paid, you know, 80 quid for your ticket, you expect to be uh, coming out of that game with a result and, and feeling happy and jubilant and all those things. And it, it sometimes makes you look at things in a much more short term yeah. view. Um, you think I can have both. I should have both. We should have this dramatic improvement today. And I get what he's, you're saying, what he's saying. It's, it's like he's looking at how do I win the title in the next two to three years. And the quickest path to that is perhaps some short term sacrifices in the form of results to build a stronger squad over the medium term. And yeah, that's by playing people of that potential. And, and we are lucky, I suppose, in that the players that are almost out of contract are ones that fans aren't scrambling to see. Right? None of us are sitting at home going, Hoiberg needs to be playing. Why is he not playing more? Same with the Celso. Like, so it's, mm-hmm. it, it, if Kane was still around right, and that whole contract thing was there, then it would be much more, hey, we've got to be playing Kane. He's the best striker we've seen in 30 years or whatever it is. And that would be true. But we don't have that right now. So you know, mm-hmm. we can we can talk about whether it should be Bissouma or Benton Curry as the six. We can talk about you know what the balance in midfield should be. Should Saar play every game? Because we know that actually all of them have a long term future, or we believe that most of them have a future under Ange. And that that does make life a bit easier. But I mean, you know, we're talking, we're having this conversation after we've lost three 0 But it's to me losing seven games out of twenty eight. I'm okay with that. For a guy that's yeah. just come into the club, I guess it sucks to lose to Fulham. Obviously, other teams have lost there, but you, you, know, you want to go there and you want to win. And if you look at the table, we're higher than them, so we should do it. But it, it does feel like every defeat is, is magnified to a point that it doesn't need to because of, of those seven defeats, what, four of them happened in that awful mid-season run? Yeah. So it, if, if you were to say that half of those four defeats went away, We'd be on five defeats for the season, which, frankly, for anyone who's new to the job, is incredible. Like yeah. I, I don't know the stats of Guardiola or, or Klopp when they took over initially, but I, I imagine it would be around the same. So, yes, I'm hopeful and dreaming that he's building something that will be akin to what they did at those clubs, but I, I, I'm also aware that like, that, that's, that's what I need to be thinking. I have to have that hope. If, I, if I'm going to lose a game 3-0, if I'm going to watch my team lose, then that hope has to be there. And like you know, had Conte gone there and lost 3-0, I wouldn't have had that hope because I'd have seen how he was playing and what he was doing. And, and just like dynasties of defensive football don't exist anymore. Like if you want to have a dynasty, they have to be attacking proactive football. And so, yeah, like maybe I'm deluded or ridiculous for thinking that Ange can do it, but from what I've seen, we are getting results and the football is okay and there is still lots of room to improve. Well, I can tell you where um, Klopp finished in his first season. It was eighth. And I remember there were people calling for his head at that time because he had come off that Dortmund team, hadn't he? And the players were burning out and getting injured left, right and centre. And everyone said, this stupid pressing system, you you you'd have to have a massive squad to make it work. Everyone's going to get injured and everything just falls apart after a season. And then he came into Liverpool. He didn't have the defenders to, to play it to his full capacity. There were people, some people were happy. Like I think most of us are, and I, I'm, I'm very happy with Ange and I, I really hope we stick with him. And I'm sure we will for the next three years. Cause I think there is um, fantastic opportunities to finish higher than we have under anyone else in the last um, 20 plus years with him. Um, but he had inefficiencies in that squad that took two or three seasons, two or three seasons to fix. And he came eighth in his first season. Then he did get fourth in his second. And I, I'd say if, if Ange got eighth and fourth, most of us should, that, that my expectation at the start of the season was eighth, playing <laughs> some good football. And now we had such a flying start to the season. People's expectations are now, no, but I've done the maths. And if we do this, that and the other, we can still catch Arsenal and win the league. And it's like, we need to just drop that for a moment and have some perspective of, of where we really are in this journey under him. Yeah, and it is, it's, it's an up and down thing because like we know, I mean, I, I truly believe that Ange goes into every season wanting to win the league, even this season. Yeah. 
even though he would have known that it would be more difficult to do, having sold Kane and all the rest of it, he, he wouldn't have given up that idea. He would know that his players are good enough to win every game. And it is a game-by-game -game basis. The, the, the struggle is that, obviously, next year we expect to have some form of European football. Um, but I, I always go back to, I mean, there aren't many managers that can come in and win straight away. Even, yeah. even today. Like, if you're going to come in and win straight away, you either are a club that can just buy whoever they want, um, or you are relatively fortunate. I mean, let's face it, like, Ranieri did it at Leicester. That was pretty fortunate. It was completely against the rest of his managerial career. Conte did it at Chelsea, kind of the perfect storm. But, you know, Guardiola couldn't do it at Man City. Like, there are there lots of examples of, of, of managers taking time. And, and, and I think, like, to me, Ange is going to do, hopefully do the job, the same job that Klopp did. Because I think that the clubs are relatively similar in the way that they were trying to get out of the doldrums, were trying to, you know, win something for the first time in a while. And, and, and they haven't got, you know, buckets of money to spend on whoever. And, yeah. and the thing with, like, what I was surprised to find out is that Liverpool's first trophy under Klopp was the Champions League against us, which was almost four years really? after he took over. And that's weird because we, we, we've now seen for the last four or five years that Man City and Liverpool have been the top two most mm. years. But, yeah, Klopp didn't win anything for Liverpool until that... Ch I still can't believe it. I must have read it wrong. But I genuinely think that was the first trophy he won at I'm Liverpool. And of, after that, then they had League Cups here and they had whatever. They obviously, they won the league, I think, the following year. But still, it was... It took a long time. They, they built... Like, you know, I think when, it, when Klopp took over, they had a pretty good attack. They would score lots of goals, but they could lose games quite easily, which is why they finished eighth. Mm -hmm. And then they went and bought Salah, and they scored even more goals, but they hadn't fixed the real problem, which was at the back. And then, as we all know, they managed to get a goalkeeper and a centre-back, and suddenly that was that, right? And they became the, 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 the giant, I guess, that they've been for, for a number of years. But it, 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 took him, it took him time. And Klopp was just as successful at Dortmund as and has been in other places. It just takes a while to get the players that you want. And obviously Klopp was lucky that Barcelona came in for one of their players for 150 million and he was able to use that money wisely. But still, like that's that's how clubs do it. Like Arsenal sadly are top, but it's taken them a number of years to get there by buying, you know, younger players and building a team and, and believing in the manager who, let's face it, no one really had any belief in, even after two seasons at the club. Yep. Lots of opposition fans were like, yeah, make him sign a longer deal. This is great. They're going to stay 8-8 eight, eight <laughs> forever. Um, I, and I am totally guilty of that myself. But it was... So, yeah, like, I, I understand the frustration of losing a game <laughs> against a team that we don't feel that we should have lost to. But the bigger picture is, do I really think that Ange is capable of doing what he wants to do and what I think Tottenham... What, I mean, what I want Tottenham to do, what I dream of... And I guess the answer is yes. And like, there's nothing to say that Conte couldn't have done that had he had the money to buy the players he wanted and instill that kind of thing. But Spurs aren't that club. We don't mm -hmm. have that kind of money and we don't have that kind of desire. And we're not going to go out and spend 70, 80, 90 million on someone who's 29. And, and not many clubs do. And right. I think just to finish, your point, it's, it's like you've said, it's, it took Arteta four years to get to the turning point of we're a title challenging squad. It took Klopp three years. It takes all the, the only uh, like anomaly in that, like we're saying, is those clubs with infinite funds and an incredible structure with those two things together. And that's the Manchester City. You've got the best manager in the world with, at the time, the richest club in the world, with probably the most forward thinking football structure with their multi-club model so the best scouting network from that in the world you put those ingredients together and you, you've got Manchester City you're an outlier but everyone else it makes the, what people like Klopp have achieved even more impressive and I'm with you I think I my vision is I see us winning either one of the Premier League or the Champions League under Ange and as something like an FA Cup along the way and him being the most successful manager I've seen in our lifetime and I'm fully on board with the approach to it if we if we all stick with him long term but if people can't have this expectation that we're going to just turn ourselves into a Manchester City and just instantly switch on the tap and start going on 15 game winning streaks in in this guy's first season I just find it um 
Chelsea, even if you look at Chelsea, by the way, since it's funny, people look at Chelsea as a club that wins loads. When you look at their honours, that Champions League win under two shells, a bit of an outlier. It kind of misleads. If you look, when they won their trophies, they were the only club with that financial advantage in the league, really, with yeah. Mourinho. And they, they had that unique advantage that they just had the best players in the world in their squad and, and an elite manager. Since City have come along and Liverpool have resurged, they haven't really done very well. They won the one league under Conte under quite a low points tally for a league winner. And they, they kind of stumbled across that Champions League. But I, they haven't won a trophy in, what, five years? No, yeah, outside of the Champions League, I, 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 don't, I don't really keep track of it, but I don't think so. Like I, know, I know they got to various cup finals and lost on penalties to Liverpool in the last few years. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's clearly more... I do believe this. It is more difficult to get to the top four now than it's ever been. It's more difficult to yeah. win the league than it's ever been. And you, know, you only have to go back a few years to find that season where, what was it, like Liverpool had 98 and Man City had 99. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. those, those that, that, that's crazy to have that many points and not win it, which is what happened to it before. But I, I think I, I like the fact that the league is getting stronger, and it's because it gives weirdly Spurs more chance. Like if mm -hmm. every team is possible of going to Wolves and losing, or going to Fulham and losing, two teams who would be happy with a mid-table finish, then that makes it more likely that one of the other teams can maybe sneak through and, and take advantage. So, mm -hmm. I, I, of course, I want Spurs to be that team that can win 30 games out of 38 every season and be there or thereabouts. But right now, it's getting to the point where 25, 26 wins might actually get you the title. That maybe 90 points. I think, I think when, when Chelsea won it with 90, they, they, they won 30-odd games, or they won 30 games exactly, which was, which was insane. Yeah. But now, it, it's maybe 28 that will get you a league title. And... 28 wins for Spurs would be incredible in a season, but we we did 26 under Poch, and we only lost four, I think, that year. 26, 8, 4. So it's uh, yeah, the, the strength of the league helps Spurs. Klopp leaving helps Spurs because that, you know, whoever comes in for Liverpool, you think will have some kind of phase where they might struggle to begin with. Um, but it's. Uh, it, 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 despite the result, it's still a good time to be a Spurs fan. I, I, I understand the bragging rights on a Monday morning and being upset because everyone's <laughs> using Spurs. Everyone's yeah. using Spurs as the banter club. Everyone's singing, you know, everywhere they go, Tottenham get battered, all, all that nonsense. But I don't, I don't think that's true. Like Spurs are not that club. They just use it on the odd occasion that, that we show it again. And yeah, and I, I often say to people like. If we won every game you expected us to win as Spurs, so let's say we see ourselves as the fourth. We're, I know revenue-wise we're the sixth biggest club in England, blah, blah, blah. But I think most of Tottenham fans would say, no, I'd say we're probably the fourth biggest club in England in their eyes in terms of like how good we should be. Um, and they'd say the only teams that I, I wouldn't come away having lost a game and feel dejected about would probably be Liverpool, would probably be City, and... Dare, well, Arsenal's always going to be disappointing because of the rivalry, but just yeah. in terms of where they are currently as a playing side. But if we lost those three home games and three away games, lose to those three teams home and away every season, and we win every other single match, which is why I fan spec, we'd have won seven of the last 10 Premier Leagues. Yeah. It, and it was something like, it's worth, when you look at 20, it's something like of the last 20 Premier League seasons, we'd have won something like 15 of the last 20 seasons. Like people's perception sometimes <laughs> just so it just seems so crazy when you put the mask down like that that sometimes where we get so obsessed over one performance are you trying to say <laughs> the game is not played on paper <laughs> is, is that yeah anyone can have a good day anyone can have a bad day teams lose games they're not supposed to and that's why the consistency is everything and, that, and that's why it's, mm. it's okay to look at games as an individual and say okay we lost three nil to fulham but that doesn't mean we're going to lose five nil to city or 8 0 to Arsenal. It doesn't work that way, right? No. Like, we all know it doesn't work that way. So I don't know why people think that it, somehow it's a sign. Obviously, performance is a pretty good indicator of success, right? The teams mm -hmm. that win tend to be the teams that play the best. Um, however, and, and, and I think that Spurs have a lot of growth. Like, we have won a lot of games and maybe we haven't played as well as that many. But I, 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 
I think the same could probably be said of Aston Villa. I know the same can be said of Man United. So it, it's like the, all those teams chasing those, those the top three right now are the ones trying to make like find a consistency in performance that will lead to a consistency in result. Mm-hmm. They're not there yet, which is why we have these ups and downs. But I'm I, I would I, I'm happy that we have we still have some growth to go, and the the manager recognizes it. Like we're not sitting here saying this is like you know we're not winning four 0 every week and still finishing second in the league. We are not that far behind as far as to, as far as things go, considering. And can we? make those jumps necessary to to be a team that loses three or four games over 28 instead of eight Mm -hmm. or seven as it is now and it's and it's the obvious thing you've got 19 other football clubs in your division all trying to do the exact same thing you're doing all with lots of money all with very smart people inside those clubs and very good athletes inside those clubs all trying to strive towards the same goal it's not as simple as just doing your job well you have to do your job the club has to run at perfection at almost every level to hit that point. And I think, at least from the manager perspective, I think we've ticked that manager box. But now we've got to get the recruitment right. Now we've got to get the whole culture of the club in the right position. We've got to get fortunes got to go your way as well. Yeah. When Liverpool won the league in their season and when they won the Champions League, both those seasons, they went crashing out of both domestic clubs, cups straight away. And that enabled them to play their strongest team every week and find this kind of perfect harmony between two competitions that they could focus on really well, avoided injuries to certain players when other teams got them. It's multiple things that have to happen for you. Um, But I did want to talk a bit, we're talking about the future of Spurs. Mm -hmm. The the international break is often a good time to reflect on like maybe where we, and as we're getting to look towards the end of the season, where we might be most focused in the transfer window end of the season. I know we discussed this earlier that we don't know what Ange is thinking, but a lot of, it seems clear that we're being linked with a lot of midfielders. So that's one position I think. But when I see that, I'm thinking, what kind of midfielder are we in need of? And what are we looking for? Because Saar's a long-term position in there. He's got the new contract. That's in he's staying. Benton Kerr, you feel, is always going to be in that squad there's links to Gallagher. Do you where, do you see us prioritising a midfielder? And if so, what kind do you see if, us if going you, for? If you're talking about what kind, then I think it has to be more of a combative, tackling, mobile midfielder. Like, I understand that Ange wants to be, you know, what wants to dominate and wants, obviously, good passes at all times. But I do think that, you know, as, as big as Saar is, he hasn't filled out, he hasn't got the physicality that he probably will have at some point. And that maybe we do need a bit more steel. I, I don't want a clogger. I don't want someone mm. who who is there to stop the other team only. But again, if you look at those successful teams over the last few years, they have had one. Like Liverpool mm. had Fabinho, and obviously Man City now have Rodri, and they've had those figures. It, all of the big teams have had figures like that in midfield, and we don't have one like that as far as I'm concerned. Mm. We are and Kante. Still a bit, with Leicester and Chelsea. Exactly. Um, I yeah. think we're, we're still a bit too nice. So mm. I can understand the desire for a midfielder and I, I don't see it as, you know, we need a rotation or a backup for Saar. I see it as we need the best we can get. Um, mm. And if that means that Saar plays less, I mean, that's football. It's awful, but like, do I, uh, am I trying to enhance Saar's career or am I trying to win football games? Am I trying to, you know, do the best for Spurs? And I think that... Uh, any manager really should be thinking, look, I want to try and do both, but I need to have the best squad I can get. Um, so like, although central midfield maybe not, may not be my first choice of where to spend money, I, I think Spurs need to. They need to try and find someone who can do that. Where is your first choice then? <laughs> um, for me, it's wingers. But we've got five. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we do have five wingers. That is true. We do. I mean, yeah. it's just that those five wingers happen to be, and I'm including Sun. I mean, this is it. Sun's played centre forward from, for most of the season, it feels like. But, I mean, who have we got? We've got Brian Hill, who's not going to be at the club much longer. We've got Solomon, who has barely been at the club and seemingly unreliable when it comes to injury. We've got Brennan Johnson, who is getting better. But I don't right now see him like you know you talked earlier about seeing Timo Werner as your first choice, first choice winger. I don't think I see Brennan Johnson as that either yet. He, he could mm. well do it. And Kuliseski, we talked about him being maybe a 
you know, maybe he's better in the middle. He obviously likes to cut inside from the wing. So it's almost like he's someone who can play out there. But, you know, in a perfect world, I want to find two wingers that can go around the outside and they can cross the ball and that have a good shot on them. And that, like, if I see them, if they get a half chance, that they might be able to arrow it in the bottom corner. Players mm. like that do exist. Um, so I, to me, that would be somewhere to go because, as I said, the wingers that we've had, a lot of them have question marks. So mm-hmm. trying to find someone who, who we, I mean, certainly when it comes to crossing, like if we're going to play Richarlison, if he's going to play lots of games, then we've seen that Kulusevski can do it, can provide the ammunition. We've seen Poro can do it, but to have someone on the other side would be very useful. I think early on before he got injured, Perisic was doing that role. Even as a substitute, yeah. he was doing it and the quality was there. No one thinks that Perisic can play 38 games in a season at his age and be that guy as your first choice winger, but the quality that he gave to the side was, pre- I think, obvious in those early games. So, to me, it's 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 like that. That's the kind of winger that I want. I want someone that offers more goal threat than maybe we have out there right now. I want someone who is who I trust to cross the ball. And yeah, so the, I think that's a, a ma- I wouldn't say a massive weakness, but I think it's an area that we could we could improve relatively easily, and and we may not have to spend a fortune on it either. And it's about a varied squad, isn't it, as well? You've got your your Johnsons, who are very good at runs into the box, and they're, they're decent finishers, and they're very direct and quick. But like we said, I the, think the, the oversimplified term everyone likes to use is the dribbly winger, um, who can also wrap his foot around it and, and, and find the bottom corner. But it's it's having those options, and I agree at the moment. It just feels very... The wide paces feel very predictable and one-dimensional at the moment. You, if I was lining up against Tottenham, and people blame it on the tactics of the team, I don't really think it is the tactics. Or, and I think it's just very predictable players that are quite easy to prepare against. You know, Timo Werner is going to be a straight run, straight runner, very quick, and you know where he's going to typically hang around in the opposition third. Um, and Johnson's been improving, but he's also quite predictable. You know, he's not going to try to dribble around you from a static position. So I guess he's quite easy to set up and defend against as well. But having that variety of player and being able to mix things up. Is definitely what we need. But... I mean, people, people have talked about how Doku has changed things for Man City, right? Because Grealish was mm-hmm. playing out there and now Doku's come in and done it. But if you look at the output, it's not been there from Doku. Mm-hmm. But the fact that he is able to beat someone from a standing start and literally just kind of knock it past them and be yep. faster than them over five yards, it, it, it does change the way City play. It changes the way that teams have to defend them, um, which is probably what they want. They want teams to back off because... If you're backing off, then suddenly you're close to go and you're able to take those shots. It's uh, I, There are clear areas that Spurs, I think, need to improve. But, you know, it, it's all about, as you said, like getting the... If you have a player like Richarlison who's good at certain things, then you have to play to those strengths. Like mm-hmm. finding a Kane who's good at everything is not going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Sun might be a very instinctive finisher, which is great because we will need that at times. but in certain games, we're not going to need that. We're going to need someone who is more of a physical presence up top. Mm-hmm. So, like, obviously we can't have 35 player squads <laughs> with individual characteristics, but still, like, you have to... It's not even a plan B as in a different tactic, but you can have different players playing the same system and it becomes a different threat. Exactly. I think, I think that's yeah. what Ange... When, you, when, you, when people talk about plan B under Ange, it's going to be along those lines. Like, Okay, Sun's not your striker, but Richarlison is, and you play differently because of it. it yes, yeah, it's it's, this, it's almost the same system with different attributed players within that system, whose natural stuff because they're playing their own game within his system, <laughs> and they have different ways of of doing that. So you can adapt the system through different types of players rather than having to overhaul the whole system. A lot of people have linked us to Jack Grealish, by the way. <laughs> oh, really? I know it would never that that seems to be a big ask for the fans. Is he's the perfect man? He's the one we need. I what did you what did you make of that as a um, I, I can kind of see why people think he's what's the word, Tottenham in inverted commas, <laughs> apart from he's from Birmingham and not at all from Tottenham. But I can see what people are saying with he kind of has the vibe of this electric, kind of exciting, gets you off your seat player, not quite good enough to play for Real Madrid, but good enough for Spurs. Um vibe. <laughs> yeah, I say I mean that, that 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 says it all, doesn't it? I I like I feel like we have Grealish because we bought Madison. I, I don't really think we need a second one of them. Like I suspect only one of them will go to the Euros. I don't think Southgate would take both. 
And I, I think that's probably it for Grealish. Like, I, I, like Grealish is a good player and he's proven it, but he, I think he proved it maybe more at Aston Villa when he was the main man and everything went through mm-hmm. him and he enjoyed that. And that's not how Spurs will play under Ange. And so I, I see the logic of wanting him, but I also think that it's, it wouldn't be a good idea, personally. That, that, that would be my belief. Yeah, and I kind of... Also, the thing that I think... Um... I, I don't like about Chris. He's always got, I know there's more to players than stats and Doku is an example of that. You, you mentioned him, but Grealish, even in his first season, he started 26 games. He scored three goals. Okay. So we were already looking at, um, Brennan Johnson's already outscored him <laughs> in half the appearances for Spurs. And then you've got 11 goals over, over three seasons, basically You're playing in an elite Manchester city side. Kind of, I don't think he fixes enough of our problems anyway as a no. footballer. And, I don't think he again, like, changes where, it. Where, yeah. where, where would he be? And like, if you think that Ange has this four-three-three system that doesn't change, is he going to play the role that Madison does? Probably, right? Because I don't see him as a winger. Mm. I, I don't see Grealish as a winger. I see him as a guy that can play out wide and can be useful. But you know, City pass you to death, right? So their wingers mm. tend to not be wingers that can beat people. Like, Doku is kind of the exception. They had, obviously, Mares for a while and Sterling, but all of those wingers, they weren't the ones that played every game, mm. right? They were the ones that you never really knew what was going to happen. What was, was, why, why was it going to be Sterling this game and Mares the next? Because it was almost, we want, we want to find more passes. That, that, that is City's thing. So mm. I just, like, it's not to say that Greenwich is a bad player, and I think that he would help Spurs. Right, I mean, there's no doubt he would help Spurs, but I don't think he is the type of player that I think Spurs are missing, and I'm, and that's kind of where I'm looking more than anything else right now. Like we we need different keys, and he's also on three hundred grand a week and twenty eight years old, so it's never I happening mean, I anyway. <laughs> that would be part of it. Like, we're we're not paying those wages, but I think anyone that City want to get rid of, City have to subsidise in some respect. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the wages are almost like Spurs can pay what they want to. And if the, if the club wants to let him go to Spurs or if he wants to come to Spurs, because all of those things matter. Like Man City would say, you know, we, we'd rather pay you 300,000 a week, 300, a week to uh, sit on our bench. Thanks. Um, than, mm. to, than to help strengthen a side that is looking to knock us off the perch. So I, I understand the logic that you know, Spurs fans are looking at the bigger teams and thinking, who, who isn't playing that much? Can we take someone who is good and maybe give them more games? But I don't know if, if Spurs are really in that place where we could say you are going to play more games for Spurs than you maybe did for... for I mean, it depends on the player, but that's just it. It depends on the player. I, I don't think if I was Ange, I would look at Grealish and say, you are my new left winger and you will be the one no. that I expect. So, Joe, because Ange doesn't work that way either. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's a logical kind of reason to, to look at him and say, hey, Grealish isn't being used much at City. He could be good for Spurs, but I think I think Spurs will be looking somewhere else. Hmm. Talking of players, though, that are linked with, and, are pro- and, and it's more likely, and I know you're, I, think, I don't believe you're this guy's biggest fan. I'm trying to think about it. Maybe it wasn't you. <laughs> but Chelsea need to raise, we, I was listening to um, TalkSport, they did have a credible person on, I forget the name, of Sebastian, Stefan, I forget his surname. Uh, he's definitely not listening anyway. He's a Manchester City fan. But Stefan, is, he was one of the financial advisors at Manchester City prior to the uh, takeover it is now. So we'd have to do with the current. But he knows um, the the rules around financial fair play and PSR really, really well. And he, his calculations were, were essentially that City need uh, Chelsea need to raise around 200 million by June 30th. Um, and it's not quite as simple as raising 200 million because... You ha- you can only offset the profit of a player. So Chelsea obviously spent a lot of money on these players. They're only going to be able to put down the difference in profit they make from each. Mm-hmm. So the one player they are going to have to sell. It doesn't matter if he's a boyhood club fan. <laughs> G- Gallagher's going to be pushed out the door, whether he likes it or not. If they if they want to try and survive the punishment of Pearson, they might just say, "Just punish me. It's not worth it. I'm never going to hit the 200 million quid." But we've been linked to him really heavily. Does he solve? Any challenges for us in that midfield, do you think? I mean, you're right to think that I'm, I'm not his biggest fan. Uh, look, Gallagher is one of those players that can do a bit of everything. Um, I feel like we have a number of those players who can do a bit of everything. 
Like, I don't think Gallagher's, Gallagher scores as many goals as you want. I don't think he's as great um, when it comes to tackling. Like, he's, he's a pressing machine, so th- that's clear. That's clear that he would help Spurs in that way. But you know, if 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 it comes down to, do I want to help Chelsea avoid a punishment to buy a player that I'm not that keen on? Then I think the answer <laughs> would obviously be no. Um, I just, it, I, I I don't see exactly why everyone loves him so much but it, it feels like you know when Mason Mount was playing every game for Chelsea and for England and you would look at him and be like I mean he's got a decent shot and he scores his fair share of goals but what else is it like is it just that he makes good decisions and managers seem to like that but there, there was nothing there was no real physical attribute that said Mason Mount is outstanding at this thing and I kind of feel the same about Conor Gallagher like what is he really good at because, as we talked about earlier, like I think we need players that have different skill sets to what we have, rather than an English version of Saar, who will ch- you know kind of score the odd goal, mm. make the odd tackle, be really good in certain defensive categories, but like affect a game not so much. I, I I I want someone who I think is more obviously affecting things, whether that be. Um, goals, <laughs> whether that be the ability, because Spurs don't have too many players that can beat a man. I don't think Gallagher has that either. And like, no. w- w- when Spurs were really good under Pochettino, the biggest thing for me is that we had players that could beat a man either through a body swerve or through, sh- through sheer skill on the ball. Like Dembele was the one who would take it round yep. the player, and Eriksson was the one that would understand where the ball's going and how much space he's got. And could do it that way, and Delhi could do it just by being Delhi with a nutmeg, right? But we had players that would take a defender out of the game, and then you would create overlaps. And Spurs don't have those players in my eyes. Not enough of them. Certainly not consistently good enough at it to to make teams stress more. That I think that's yes. why we've seen we've seen teams defend successfully against us by just sitting deep and waiting for a mistake. And- I, I, go on. But I was going to say, this is why, and this is partly why I think Madison's performances have fallen off, is because we don't have that midfielder. He's now sat in front of the centre-backs, yeah. trying to be that person to fill that void in our team. And like you're saying, on the flip side, you, you, your players have either got to, ideally they're both, they've either got to be really press-resistant or very good passes. Because that's the only way you're going to get the ball forward mm-hmm. as a player. You're either going to beat your man or you're going to pass it to someone else ahead of them by being a good passer. And and seems to favour players who can are press resistant, who can drip, go past someone. And like you say, apart from Benton Curry's count injury and not really doing it, none, Saar doesn't do it. Right. None of our, our centre backs don't really do it either. So there's no one really in that team. Kulisevsky is at least he tries to do it. He's probably the best at doing it on the front third of the pitch, but he's not amazing at it. But he's certainly he's okay at it. He's the best we've got. We definitely lack, like you're saying, that Dembele type in midfield, don't we? That's just going to drive it and allow Madison to stay up where he should be. And, and you made the point about Madison dropping deep. And, like, I think it's, it's weird. As much as I think Spurs as a club are like Liverpool when it comes to developing and getting to the top table, the way that we play is probably almost a bit more pep than it is more Klopp. Like, we're not heavy metal thrashing. We're not making, you know, four or five runs off the ball and just overloading it in all parts of the pitch. We, we, we do want to win the ball higher, but then we want to be more like Man City with it. And if you look at Man City and you watch them play, like you never see De Bruyne, Bernardo Silva, any of those more intricate attacking midfielders. They don't pick the ball up from the centre-backs. They stay 10, 20 yards ahead of them and they trust the centre-backs or whoever, Rodri and Stones in midfield or whoever it is, they trust the back five to pass the ball to them. Mm-hmm. Right, and because obviously, if you're able to trust your back players to do it, then it gives you more players in an attacking area. What, what we find watching Spurs, it seems, is if if Madison's dropped deep and Sara Basuma are already naturally deeper anyway, because that's the type of players they are, then he's got three people to aim for. Mm-hmm. Right, like it's possible that a doggy is further forward, but generally speaking, he's got three people to aim for, two of which may not be good at holding the ball up. Because yep. if Richarlison's not playing, it's basically only Kulisevsky that can. And even then, it's an easy thing to defend if it's the only option you're facing. 
So, mm -hmm. like, clearly that will come with time. But I think there is this understanding that like, we know Van der Ven can pass it. We know Romero can pass it. So maybe we should trust them to do it more. And Madison should say, you know what? It's not my job to go and get the ball. I may want the ball. I may want to be the man who's carving the turkey at the roast dinner, whatever it is he means by that. But this idea of, no, no, like, I'm going to be more effective if I'm closer to the opponent's goal. That's mm -hmm. what I've been signed to do. And the closest we came to scoring, apart from those two, you know, wide open goal we missed, was when Madison had that chance, I think at nil-nil, when he was on the edge of Fulham's box, was able to take half a touch, kind of move it to the side and almost put it in at the near post to wrong foot Leno. Like, that's where you want Madison to do what he can do. I don't need those, you know, small half turns when he's, next, when he's standing next to Romero. It doesn't make any sense. I think Spurs have had this underlying, this same underlying problem, not just under Ange, but they had it players-wise with Conte and at the end of Poch as well. Like we, ever since Dembele effectively left or hit the end of his career, because we had we had Modric who did that kind of, he was that midfielder that drove the ball forward, and then it was Dembele, and then Dembele left, and we had a kind of bit of a tailor off. Then suddenly Kane went, I'll do it. And he became this kind of sits deep, pings the ball out and kind of our creative engine again. But he was just plastering over the cracks of a, t a squad that didn't have those efficiencies in midfield or that that perhaps passing ability, which well, certainly didn't have the passing ability out of defence back there. And I think that's partly why every manager tried to make it work dire because they were like, you know, you've played in midfield. You could kind of do this hybrid role for me <laughs> and maybe you're my answer to that. Um, so and it is going to take a couple of windows to fix because it's it, it requires three or four players <laughs> who can offer something from from the defence to the midfield rather than just one person who's going to fix it all. I, I, I'm, I'm comparing him. I'm comparing Spurs to Man City. We've obviously had the same manager for what eight <laughs> seasons now. So obviously we're not going to be at that level. Obviously it will take time. I understand that, but like. If we're going to play the same system, if we're going to say this is how we're going to play, this is our system for the next I don't know how long, then we have to play it now. And, and yeah. we, we've often heard about and saying if players make mistakes, then that's on me, it's not on them, I want them to be brave. I don't really remember seeing Spurs being that brave. Like all those mistakes, like I mean, do you remember the game at Arsenal at the start of the season where Medicine was pickpocketed basically in our own area yeah. and Gabriel Jesus whacked it over the bar? Like, that hasn't happened for a long time, which is good, right? True. But the, the, the bravery that we're talking about, yeah, like we try to play through teams, but if people aren't in the right places, you're playing through that first line, mm. but all that means is, well, then what? Like, you have to go back again. Like, if we get, through, if we get past the, the, op the opposition's front three, it doesn't mean a great deal. What we need to be doing is finding the half spaces between the centre-backs and the midfield. So that way we can turn and we can we can damage teams. And I, it, it feels like it's been a while since we were able to do that. But again, Spurs are a work in progress. Like players will be signed. We will get better at what we're doing. I really believe that. And I'm sure that players are looking at film and seeing the things that maybe fans are seeing. I would hope that they are. But it's like the, the use of the 11 that we have, we, we're just not getting the best out of it. Mm-hmm. So I think the summary of this episode really is <laughs> give Ange time. It it will work out, but it's it's not as simple as playing a system and turning everything around. <laughs> no, because I mean, like, like every team that has tried to do that has struggled. And yeah. like I, I'm not stupid. I could sit here and say that Spurs, I, mean, I believe it, Spurs have won a number of games this season that probably we were in the balance and we got the important goals. And so that's yeah. why we got the points. It wasn't that we were much better than the opponent. It's just that we took our chances. And there have been games where the opposite has happened, where mm. we've played really well and it hasn't, it hasn't worked for us. I, I, I want to think that even in the next 10 games, that we will see progress of Spurs doing what we want to do. Like, mm. obviously, teams have realized how Spurs want to work and they are working against that and they are organizing themselves to, to, to stop whatever it is that Ange wants us to do. But that doesn't mean that we stop doing it. It just means we get better at it. Like the runners off the ball need to be there. We haven't. Mm -hmm. We don't really have that anymore. And and so it's you know, it's not easy. Like no one thinks this is easy football. But if it's one of those weird things that if you're brave enough to do it and you are successful at it, 
you won't need to do it anymore because teams will think, well, we'll just stand back then. Yeah. Right now, they think they can press Spurs, so they'll go for it. And, you know, maybe four times out of ten, they're successful. But if, if, it, if it goes down to one or two times out of ten, then, then the they, they, they won't do it. Yeah. They won't do it. Yeah. it. It's too dangerous for them then. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we see when any team plays a Manchester City or a Liverpool. They set up differently to everyone else. And as a Spurs, you go, why are they playing different? Why are West Ham so crap when they're playing? Why are Arsenal so crap playing West Ham? And why are West Ham so good when they play us? It's because they're petrified of Arsenal and they're not petrified of playing their game against us. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, we do need to wrap up there. Um, but thanks so much for joining. And you can find HG on the cheese room if... Um, yeah, if, if if you enjoyed the content today, it's it's a really good pod over there. So yeah, check it out. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. We always finish with an up Spurs. So up Spurs. Up Spurs. <laughs> <laughs>